We're going to start on time today, guys. And if you would, could you uh, bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, we are so blessed to be used as instruments in your hand to talk to others about you. And sometimes those encounters can be difficult and challenging, but we know, Lord, we don't have to know everything, uh, even though we're going to study, even though we're going to go over uh, a lot of truth and a lot of facts and a lot of insight. Um, Lord, we can be confident in what we know, and we can also be confident in what we don't know because we know that you are the way and the truth in the life, and you are the truth. So even in what we don't know, Lord, we can be confident in you. So with humility, we proceed, and uh, I pray, inviting your, your spirit to be present here today through me, uh, in the hearts of everybody listening, and in the heart of those who would even hear this recording. And uh, we're praying, Lord, that it'll make a difference for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So this is one of my favorite topics, and it's one that uh, I'm really excited about. We are going to talk about witnessing to Jehovah's Witnesses today. This is a good one. And I got to say, uh, there's all different types of folks that we'll encounter in our time uh, as Christians sharing the gospel. And there's all different sorts of strategy. And this is one uh, that I particularly enjoy because witnessing with Jehovah's Witnesses, um, from my experience, has been uh, uh, they think very linearly. So they're, 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 they're thinking logically. They're thinking linearly. Um, they're looking at grammar. They're looking at facts to be able to back up their points. Okay. Whereas in the Mormon faith, there's magical glasses. There's there's all these different ideas that we just have to believe, and there's really no linear logical way to believe them. Like Joseph Smith translated these tablets using these, these glasses that he found, because he was illiterate. He couldn't read or write, but he found these glasses, and then he finds these gold tablets, and he, the glasses help him translate, and then the tablets disappear into heaven or whatever, and, and now nobody can follow up on his work. So, so th we're not talking about that kind of... You know, how do you deal with that? You know, it's like you're our word against theirs, right? Well, we can, we, we're going to do that in two months. We're going to tackle Mormonism. But, but this is a lot different. This is very, they're using the Bible. There's no other holy book. They're using the Bible. And Jehovah's Witness will use your Bible. In fact, one of the, one of the tactics that they will do to give the comfort, comfort to the person at the door that they are at is say, hey, can you go get your Bible? So we then go get our Bible, and then they point in your Bible, hey, Jesus is lesser than the Father. In fact, what I wanted to do is I wanted to start by sharing with you guys my first encounter with Jehovah's Witness. You know, growing up in a Christian home, my dad was a missionary kid. We did Bible. We, we were into the creation evolution thing. I mean, we st and I heard him talk about Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, and he actually dealt a lot with them in Africa when he lived there. Uh, there were some folks that they'd converted from Jehovah's Witness in Zambia during his 18 years in Zambia. And so he, he's very used to it. So I had heard about Jehovah's Witnesses, but we never really studied the topic. I never studied it. But my first encounter was in the fall of 1995. I was 17 years old, and I was sick. I was homesick, and I'll never forget it. I was, I'll never forget it. I'm sitting in my bed on Saturday morning uh, looking out my front out of my window of my bedroom, and a car pulls up and parks across the street, and like three or four people jump out with some Bibles and stuff. And so I'm like, I think those are Jehovah's Witness. I'm like, you know, I was well enough to go have a conversation, so um, I'm like, I hope they knock on my door. I'm going to eat their lunch, right? And so sure enough, the door knocks. I go and answer the door, and I invite them inside, very nice, well-dressed, uh, and they had like a, a kid that actually was going to my high school. There was yeah, I'm like, dude, oh, I didn't realize. You, you, you're in my school. How you doing? Oh, good. Man. See the football game? You know, nice, real nice, uh, nice guy. He was a friend of mine. I didn't realize that he was a Jehovah's Witness. And so very pridefully and very arrogantly, I thought to myself, I'm going to tell these guys what's up, right? And then they bust this verse out at me. 
John 20, 17, they said, Dave, can you help me answer a question? Go get your Bible for me. I'm like, okay, sure. Go get my Bible. And I come back. And they say, open to John uh, 20, 17. And it says, Jesus is saying, I am returning to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. If Jesus is God, how can he be returning to God, to his God? He has a God? Wait, I thought he was God. You don't, don't you believe that he's God? Well, if he's returning to his God, how can he be God? And there's only one God. 17-year-old kid, my pride and arrogance went right out the window, man. <laughs> I was like, wow. And, and I, I was troubled. So before we move on, I've got to, how, if you were to be asked that question, how would you answer? Anybody? If, I, if Jesus is returning to his God, how, how, how do we answer that question? Is he answering as a man? That's what I would say. Okay. He's answering as a man in his human, right? Anybody else want to add to it? It's not easy. Ryan? I think God the Father has always been God the Father. God sent his son as, and himself as flesh and for human. So, so Jesus is saying, I'm going to return to my Father at the right hand where I belong. Curtis? It doesn't say explicitly, I'm not, I'm not God. There's no implicit speaking saying here. There's a, there's a definition that is there, but that definition alludes to the Trinity. Doesn't allude to a separation of uh, him being the Okay, that's good. I guess one of the one of the explanations that I saw because it's a, it's an interesting the way it's worded is compelling, right? It's pretty compelling. Jose, how about John eight? John eight, when Jesus says, "I'm and the Father are one." Right. So doesn't that complement that? It's going to my Father, which is also me. Mm -hmm. And going to my God, which is I'm God also, because we are one. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that's that's a great point because now we're going to get into the doctrine, the whole thing about the Trinity, right? Mm -hmm. So that's that's what that's ultimately where we answer it, and it's not just a one snapshot answer that fits nicely in one line. Mm -hmm. Is we have to get into some some deeper theology, and we have to incorporate a lot of other verses. However, one of the thoughts that was on this verse, he said, Jesus is actually clarifying. If you notice, if he didn't say, hey, I'm going to be returning to our, our Father and our God, he actually clearly separates his relationship with the Father and his relationship with God is different than yours. It's your Father and my Father. There's a difference in that relationship. Now, we have to explain what that difference is. Um, Mike, you want to add anything to that? The important thing to remember is that the, the word God is a title, and you can liken that title of God. Uh, what's worked for me is uh, comparing God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to, say, a board of directors. It's a title. Board of directors. If you were to replace board of directors to, to my board, well, then you get a better understanding that it's not his, he's not giving himself an identification in a personal sense. He's giving himself an identification in, in, a, in the sense of title. So anytime that there's a point where it appears Jesus less, appears to be less than God in Scripture, I'll, I'll use a board of directors illustration. Just as you could have a president, vice president, and secretary on the board, you have Father, Son, Holy Spirit in the Godhead. A, a vice president may say, well, I'm going to return to my board. Does that make sense? Does it, does it mean that he's the only person on the board? And, and that's important for us to remember. Cool. Yeah, so I mean, there's a number of verses that they'll use, such as uh, the, where Jesus says, the Father is greater than I am. That would be the same principle, right? Um, when, you say, when he says, the Father is greater than I am, he's not saying that in, in nature the Father is greater than he is, but he is greater in what? Authority, right? So uh, the President of the United States is greater than me in authority, obviously, but he's no more in nature. We, are the same, we have the same nature. So a lot of those, a lot of those kind of um, interesting verses that seem to imply Jesus saying that the Father is somehow more or more than He is, or so on. That's an authority, not so much nature. So, um, but here's what happened to me on that day. So, I, they they leave, 
It's like they, they came in with they came in with like a sledgehammer, man, and just like bam, hit me on the head and walked out. And and I and they and I left. And I'm thinking, man, they came in and showed me in my Bible that Jesus has a God. It happened to be that at that time I was working as a valet guy in a Jewish country club. Hence the the last couple months that we had on the witnessing to to Jewish folks. Um, I was in a very deep thought process on, is Jesus actually the Messiah? It's amazing to me that, that all these Jewish people missed that. Like, how do they miss that with all these amazing prophecies and so, and so on? And so what it did to me is, if this New Testament deal was just written by a bunch of fools, then I'm worshiping a false god. And I actually started, I'm, now here I'm sick, I, I had pneumonia. And I'm sick in bed, and I'm <gasps> and I'm wheezing, and it's and it's two twelve o'clock in the evening, one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, and I'm sweating, and I I can't get this out of my mind, and I'm not like a hyper spiritual guy, you know, spiritualize everything and so on, and this is a very rare, this is a very few settings I'll tell the story, but for this class I'll tell the story, um, th- that there was I felt I began to feel what I believe was a demonic presence. I felt I was on my, bre- on my bed, and I felt the presence of something, and I felt trapped on my bed. I felt like I could not move. And I, and I stayed there terrified for about a half an hour as I'm battling with, with Jesus' divinity. And I'm sitting there sweating. I, I wish I could, like, th- my bed was wet with how much sweat I had. And then, and I, I was battling with the, the intellectual thing of what I had heard, that I'm worshiping a false god, if that's true, and this is, you know, so eventually I said, enough, I I literally, I had a high bed, about this tall, and I rolled out of that bed and fell down onto the floor, face down, and I said, God, I'm going to pick up my New Testament, and I'm going to start in Matthew chapter 1, and and I'm not going to stop reading until you show me a verse where Jesus says he's God. So I pick up Matthew chapter, I, 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 I said, Lord, I am not, and I'm not a reader, believe it or not. I, I don't, you know, I, I can only handle a small chunk at a time. But I was determined, I was not going to put my Bible down until I found a verse that said Jesus was God. Isn't God good? Right in Matthew chapter 1. I, I, I spent five minutes reading and then God gave me this verse. Matthew 1.23 says, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. The sweat stopped. And I'm like, whew. <laughs> All right. Crawled up in my bed and went straight to sleep. I slept, slept like a baby. And so, but that was that thing where um, my pride really hindered me in that moment. And then the, the, intellectual, the intellectual debate in taking it uh, with, with pride, not with humility, but with pride, uh, really messed with my spirit, really messed with my heart. And so I just wanted to make sure that as we approach any topic, that we're always approaching with humility. Never think that you're going to be able to, you're going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to eat this guy's lunch if you want to quote me. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, I'm not, we're not going to approach any conversation like that. There's always something that you can learn from the person that you're talking to. All right. So now um, I wanted to share with you guys, thank you, sir, um, the book that Ultimately, uh, I mean, if you guys read through that thing that, that I sent out a couple weeks ago, I mean, a lot of the influence that came from that was from this book. And, I, and I'm hoping that Ron Rhodes writes a letter to Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale, saying, guys, we just got like 100 copies of this book sold. And what, what happened? You know, I'm hoping that happens because this is one of the finest apologetic books that I've read at, in any topic. The way he, lo- the way he cuts out... You know, a lot of authors like to ramble with their own stories, with their own words, their own ideas, and so on and so forth. He cuts through all of that and hits straight to the point. Every single, you know, I'm a highlighter and kind of underliner kind of guy. My book is torn to shreds. You can see my copy over there. It's falling apart. Every single line in this book has meat in it. It's incredible. It's 400 some pages. So uh, I strongly suggest that everybody picks it up. Um, and he has got a whole series. He's got reasoning with Masons, reasoning with Muslims, reasoning with Roman Catholics, and uh, and Mormons. So uh, 
I, I found that the other ones are helpful, but something about this one particular, like that there's really, I, I don't know who he was getting his uh, info from and, and uh, influence from in writing this, but he just hammers it. And I, I strongly suggest picking up a copy. It should be in everybody's library. And, and there's a question, are Jehovah's Witnesses Christians? You know, a lot of people from the outside, they don't know the difference. They, they'll look in and see uh, guys that have a Bible in their hand, and they're well-dressed. Well, some Christians aren't so well-dressed, but, but they're well-dressed. They come in, you know, dressed really nicely. They're very polite, nice, and they got their Bible, and they want to talk to you about Jesus and, and the, the coming of the end of times and all this Armageddon stuff. And so now, from the world's perspective, you and I are this, uh, us and them, we're, they're the same. But ultimately, um, are they Christians? They're not. They're not. They're not Christians. Now, I'm not going to judge any person unto salvation because the Bible commands me not to do that. However, the doctrine, that is, the belief system is unchristian. Okay? And so, here's a few of the things that separate us, and I apologize for the small writing here, but um, they, the major tenets that separate uh, Jehovah's Witness from mainstream Christianity is that Jesus is not God. I'm going to go through these very quickly. For the sake of the audio, I'm going to read them. Uh, Jesus is not God. There is no Trinity. Jesus is not. Jesus is actually Michael the Archangel, okay? And that God changed him into Jesus, a man just like you and me. And then he came. He did his thing on, on earth. He died not on a cross, but on a on a stake or a peg or a, a tree. He was pinned with his hands above his head, not outstretched, okay? Um, and that when he died, his body dissolved into just the elements of the earth, okay? And then when he resurrected, it wasn't a bodily resurrection, but a spiritual resurrection. And, the, and, the, and you know, here's, a, here's something that I'm kind of a little confused on, but it, I, I actually read in certain places that they believe that the, the bodies that Jesus said, hey, touch me here, that wasn't his body, but was some kind of manifestation of a body that he used so that he could prove to them. And he's just saying, hey, uh, I got flesh and bones here. I'm eating with you. That was all just a manifestation so that they could believe that he was real. But he wasn't, it wasn't his body at all. It wasn't his original body. Not his original body. It was a different, it was like a, a renewed body. And that's how they explained that, remember that uh, most of the disciples didn't recognize him. Mm -hmm. That's how they explained it. Okay. All right. Uh, so he, um, they believe in the doctrine of soul sleep, uh, both the saved and the unsaved. When they die, your body goes into the earth, and you go into a spiritual uh, unconsciousness, if you would. You're not, you're not awake, you're not conscious, uh, and that at the end, when God is going to do this resurrection thing, now he's going to raise up our bodies. There's no, there's no difference between the, we don't have a spirit, if you would. What we have, our soul dies with our body, if you would, and that, that's going to be raised up at the last day. Okay, and they, they'll, use, they'll try to twist 1 Thessalonians 4 and a few other verses where it talks about that um, those who sleep in Christ. Okay, so they believe that, on, that a heaven only fits 144,000 people, that there's this thing called the anointed class that, that filled up in 1935. Uh, heaven's full, so we can't get there. But um, the second, you know, plan B is kind of this paradise earth thing. So then when the resurrection happens, Jesus is going to rule the earth, and we're going to um, be in paradise earth along with him. So we never make, Jehovah's Witnesses now never make it to a heaven. That was reserved for the 144,000. Interestingly enough, all the Old Testament saints, they believe, will be with us on paradise earth, not in heaven. Okay? Um, they deny the literal punishment of hell. Uh, obviously, if, if we're uh, those who at the resurrection... Uh, who are saved and are going to enjoy paradise earth, they would, they would do that. But those who are not saved uh, would be annihilated for eternity. There's no, they just cease to exist. So there's no hell, there's no punishment, there's no consciousness. That's just it. They deny salvation by grace, grace through faith alone. In order to be saved, you must be an active, baptized member of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Salvation can come by no other means and by... The, and by Active, like when you say an active member, they're talking about active witnessing, door-to-door -door kind of thing, right? Is that, that's basically what that means? Uh, so they're, if, if you're not doing that and you die, it's, uh, it's lights out, literally. <laughs>
Jesus is, uh, and also Jesus already returned invisibly, spiritually in 1914. They'll say, well, he went after his resurrection, he transformed back into Michael the archangel. And since angels are invisible to us, spirits are invisible, he returned in 1914 and is now dwelling with us uh, on earth, right? He's here now, right? They, they believe, well, they believe he's still ruling from heaven, but his presence is here. His, pr his presence is here, okay. So, m more to come on that. It's, it's kind of fun. All right, so, uh, a, a brief, what I wanted to do is go, uh, go over a brief history of the Watchtower, just so that we know who we're talking about, okay? So, the founder is this guy, Charles Taze Russell. He was born in 1852 in Pennsylvania, and he was born into a, a Presbyterian, uh, the Presbyterian church. He later started attending a congregational uh, church, but he had major challenges with three doctrines of the Christian faith. Number one was the, the deity of Christ, the Trinity, and the doctrine of hell. So he had challenges with those, and by the time he was 18 years old, 1870, he started his own home Bible study. So... You know, Pastor Greg would be proud. You know, he's got own home Bible study. He's 18 years old, and now there's 8 million Jehovah's Witnesses that started from a home Bible study, okay? So, but, but he later became the pastor of that flock. They called him Pastor Russell. And in 1879, he started publishing the Watchtower magazine. And today, there's 25 million monthly copies. And I'm going to grab one of the Watchtower magazines. Um, this, this publication comes out every month. It's called the Watchtower Magazine, and there's 25 million copies of this put out every single month, and it's in 148 different languages worldwide. Every single month, every Jehovah's Witness around the entire world is on the same page, literally. Okay, it's pretty pretty phenomenal. The, the organization uh, in that in that organization is very organized. Very, very organized, okay? Now, as a sister publication called Awake, and I think I have one. Look at that. It's awesome. This is a, and what would be the difference between the Watchtower magazine and Awake magazine? Is there? The Watchtower is more the theological study, the, the, the doctrine, and the Awake is supposed to be more uh, current event focused. Okay, great. Well, there's, um, we've got 22 million copies of this go out every month, all right? So a lot of people are getting these. These documents, they'll, they're very quick to hand them to you, very quick to uh, give those to you. And I, I, I have a nice little collection that I'm starting to accumulate. I, I like this stuff because um, it seems that, seems that the more stuff I get, the more, actually the more ammunition they give because there's all kinds of, well, you'll see what I mean in a few minutes. But uh, <coughs> during his time, uh, Russell was invited into, into many you know, before they sep he actually separated himself off of mainstream Christianity, he was invited into many uh, Protestant churches to preach from pulpits. And he traveled around. He was kind of an itinerant preacher. And they said before he died, he had traveled over a million miles preaching different places, um, but also authoring these publications that were coming out every month. In 1882 is when Russell openly rejected the doctrine of the Trinity and separated his group out from mainstream Christianity, okay? Now, here's one of the, here's one of the interesting things that it was true about him in the past, about the Jehovah's Witnesses, but not so now. But they had a, he had a great interest in end times events, which Jehovah's Witnesses still do, but that they were connected with pyramidology. So Russell believed that by looking at the pyramids... By looking at the pyramids, you could, through some sort of, that they were created in a way that you could find out when the end times, end things were going to happen, okay? And so um, we, have a, we have a couple examples of that later and some quotes from his writings. So, but based on his pyramidology, all of his, you know, all of his end time dates didn't really come from the Bible. It had nothing to do with Bible giving the equations for these end, these false prophecies. They, they, the equations of the false prophecies came from the measurements of things coming from the pyramidology and incorporating them to, to select verses that he chose to try to make a case for Jesus is going to return in. And here's a few of his false prophecies. We got um, 1874, uh, and then the famous one is 1914. And then they said, whoops, we made a, a slight miscalculation. It's really 1915. And then the watch, I think he was dead by here, but 19, I think he died in 1916. Uh, 1918, the Watchtower Society said, well, here, here's what it really was. 1918 was going to be the end of things. 
And so they're right there uh, in that span of, you know, 45 years or whatever it was, they falsely prophesied the end of the world five times. And four of them came directly, was that four times? Four times. Three of them came directly from Russell himself based on the pyramidology uh, stuff. So the, uh, the Watchtower followed this tradition and, and they actually were saying in 1925 when you know, World War II was going on, they were saying that World War II was actually the Great Tribulation. They were actually equating the World War II to the Great Tribulation, but when World War II ended, it's like, uh, whoops. And so um, they, then they came up with the prediction of 1975 for the, the end, of time, end of things. So, all right, here we go. Uh, Russell died on October 31st, Halloween Day, um, ironically enough, 1916. And they erected this big pyramid headstone right on top of his grave in Pennsylvania. And it's pretty, pretty interesting. And then carved right on the top of the pyramid there is the symbol of a cross. Because back then, they, they didn't believe in the whole stake thing. So um, we'll, get, we'll get more to that later. All right? Brief, okay, brief history. Now, he died in, in 1916. When that happened, this guy, jo Joseph Franklin uh, Rutherford, assumed the presidency after Russell's death. And that's him pictured up here on the top. And Russell... Rutherford moved away from period, uh, pyramidology, later calling it satanic. So uh, it's a little bit of a difference, isn't it? But it's funny how the, the dates that they, that they still believe that Christ came invisibly in 1914, that that date came from Russell's measurements of the pyramids, but was a doctrine that was satanic. So we'll get more on that later. But uh, in 1931, the organization was officially... Uh, named the Jehovah's Witnesses, okay? After Rutherford's death in 1942, this fellow here, Nathan Knorr, uh, Homer Knorr, became the president, and he began to deflect attention away from himself. So he's not the one publishing the, the literature. The, the literature actually became uh, anonymous, okay? So the, the New World Translation and all the publications, they're not putting names attached to it, and it's a claim to humility that we're not, we're not trying to promote a human being, but ultimately, what's the problem with not attaching a name to, to a publication? When you falsely prophesy the end of the world, we can't point a finger, can we? All right? So now, so now but actually that kind of helps our argument to say, hey, we're not pointing at, a fin at, at an individual. It's the whole organization. Because they're saying that the whole organization is coming up with the state. All right? So now, uh, lastly, when, uh, when Nor became president, he wasn't as much of a doctrine kind of guy, but there's this guy here, Frederick Franz. He was uh, sort of a doctrine junkie, and he, uh, Nor gave all the doctrine stuff over to Franz. So Franz, we're going to see, is one of the major contributors to the New World Translation, which we'll talk about right now. Uh, 1950, they published this New World Translation. The first rendition uh, was, was published, and then there have been several publications, how many, like seven or eight that have come out, uh, uh, um, revisions? Um, since the 1950s, I believe it's four. Four, okay. So four, four times that they said, you know what, let's go back, and uh, there's some things we missed, some more things to hide, or whatever, however you want to call it. But the, there's, there's, uh, the, the one read, reading in 1950 is a lot different than the one that reads now. And Pastor Mike's actually got this new one. Ooh, pretty. Because all the Bibles kind of like had the black cover, but I actually got it pictured over here. This is the Silver Sword edition, and that's nice and fancy. And uh, I don't know how much have you have you been able to really Not dig in? Just the key verses. Key verses. All right. So either way, um, my this book. If you were to look through my ver my little thing here, it's all got all kinds of notes in it, man. I got it's it's good. When they come to my door in the future. Or now I can go get my copy of the New World Translation and say, yeah, I got, this is your Bible, right? Oh, yeah. So now I've got my notes written right in the margins. It's pretty effective. Um, there was a, and this, this edition here, the Silver Sword, was released in October of 2013. Uh, so they had this big 129th annual meeting together. And, this, and then this guy, uh, Jeffrey Jackson, who is, was the guy who was going to unveil this new silver sword edition, he, he said that Jehovah really hooked us up with some great weather so that we could um, 
you know, make sure we get his word out with a, with a bang, right? But the Silver Sword Order became already a limited edition because what they did was they found a, a big time editor's error up here in numbers where they flipped the, uh, the, the verses around. So they actually had to retract all the things that they just released that, you know, from the, from the release of this, you know, of this uh, new edition uh, be, and that Jehovah made sure the weather was really good for um, because this here, it says, this, this page is, goes from Numbers 35 to Numbers 33. So it's, they flipped it, so they had to retract them all and then fix it, put it back out. Huh? Read it backwards. Read it backwards, all right? All right, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't hit that too hard. It's, oh, that's just, the, that's just the thing on top. That's not the Word of God. So anyway, um, History of the Watchtower continued. They're, no, they're best known for door-to-door -door evangelism. Okay, that's part of the deal. Part of the deal being uh, saved, baptized Jehovah's Witnesses that you're going to be doing door-to-door uh, -door evangelism. Uh, they're known for not celebrating birthdays or holidays such as Christmas and Easter. Uh, they do not allow blood transfusions. We all have heard those things. And they do not allow members to vote or belong to government in government positions such as the military. So those are the things that, hey, what, what does the world know Jehovah's Witnesses for? That's what they know Jehovah's Witnesses for. But the world kind of lumps us a lot of, often into the, into the category. They don't really know the, the major differences because there's a lot of things that look similar. All right? Today there's over 8 million Jehovah's Witnesses that meet in 90,000 kingdom halls worldwide. The headquarters is here, this building here in Brooklyn, New York. And it's governed by this board of 12, uh, I guess they're elders. Is that what they would call them? This, this board of 12 guys? Body. Governing body. Okay. And, uh, and all this is public stuff. They put all that out. And the, they believe and teach that the, the Watchtower Society, this, this group of guys here, is the sole way that God communicates to the people on earth. And there's no other way that God communicates. It's through the Watchtower Society. Okay? So um, salvation only comes through being a baptized active member of the Watchtower Society. Okay? So now... The, one, of the, one of the crazy things is that there's a, there's a teaching of that, and, and, I, and I don't know, like, how does this sound? Would they say, don't, would they actually verbalize, don't think for yourself, you have to think through this? Do they actually verbalize it that way? No, not, not that clearly. Okay. Well, here's, here's a, here is, it's a subtle thing, but, that, but this is what they do is with subtle notes and writings through these publications, here's what they'll say. This is one from... Uh, the studies in scriptures, okay, back in 1988. But not, not only do we find that people cannot see the divine plan in studying the Bible by itself, but we see also that if anyone lays the, the scripture studies aside, meaning these publications, even after he has used them, after he has become familiar with them, after he has read them for 10 years, if he then lays them aside and ignores them and goes, to the Bible alone, though he has understood the, his Bible for 10 years, our experience shows that within two years, he goes into darkness. On the other hand, if he had merely read scriptures, scripture studies with their references and had not read a page of the Bible, as such, he would be in the light at the end of the two years because he would have had the light of the scriptures. Okay? So that's a pretty bold statement. So if, if you were to put this aside and just read the Bible in two years, you won't know what's going on with your faith. But if you were to put the Bible aside and pick these up and read these only for two years, you're going to be right on target. Okay? Pretty wild. Yes, ma'am. Who appoints these people? Are they voted in or are they just appointed from the first guy? I honestly do not know the answer to that question. Okay. Uh, I, I think they're treated like a board of directors, so they would be voted in. I don't know who votes them. <laughs> There's a lot of the, the operational side of the organization is not clear to the average member. Got it. All right. So let me. I got a question. How would we? <laughs> how would we respond to this? How would we respond to this? If you if you were to just read this for two years, you'd be good. But if you were to put the Bible away for two years, uh, I'm sorry. If you were to read only the Bible for two years, you'd be in darkness. They said. And it says that because he would have the light 
of the scriptures. If you put the scriptures aside, you'd be in the light of the scriptures if you read these. That's, uh, yeah. Paul wrote Timothy in order to give her instruction. He would not go to public instruction like that. He would be in their interpretation of the scripture. He would read it. The word of God is active in the wild and sharper than any of the other two. Awesome. And I'll go with Psalms 119 also, with, um, David speaking, saying that uh, your word I have written in my heart that I might not sin against you. So, they're going against the Bible also because these people. You know, it's crazy. I love this quote. It's a fun quote, isn't it? It's a nice one to tack, tuck in our back pocket. All right. Now, here's one. This is a fun one. Uh, I was going through when I moved. I moved four and a half years ago from my townhouse to uh, to here uh, to where I live in Coconut Creek now, and I'm going through my my books. All my, I've got books and boxes, and you know, just kind of any. My wife's kitchen cabinetry, I just stuff them anywhere I can find space. But, but I'm, I'm putting all my books in boxes, and I look at this, and this was right after having uh, some very in-depth conversations with Jehovah's Witness and accumulating these materials. And I, and I find this book in my, in my library, and I'm like, oh, something's, something's different about this. I don't know what it is. And I'm thinking, it's got the same color, it just... The pictures, it looks like the same artist even. And I, and I thought, I wonder if this is a Watchtower publication. Sure enough, um, I look in the back. It's a watch, it's, it's Jehovah's Witness Watchtower publication. It's a Bible story book for children, okay? And so, but here's the thing. How did it get in my library? I have no idea how it got in my library. That's the point. It, the point is, uh, talk about wolves in sheep's clothing. You know, they're giving stuff. Just talk about Jesus. Here is it. Yeah, some Bible stories for your kids. Okay, take it. But in, in there, if you were to read through it, there's pictures of Jesus on a stake and you know, talking about who he's not, how he's not God and he's Michael the Archangel. And it's, all, it's got all that stuff in there. So if I were an, uh, an ignorant Christian and not studied, I'd pick that up and I would start believing this. Okay? So the Jehovah's Witness, like what, what do they think about you? So now we're going to switch gears going from the history to what do they think when they're when you're in front of a Jehovah's Witness? How do they view you and me? What what are they thinking? And what what they think about Pastor Mike uh, is even a whole lot different, right? Because you used to be there. <laughs> so um, th what what they think about you? Here's a couple bullet points. You know, like number one, remember how we were talking about how unified they are? That at, literally at all places of the earth. There's, they, have, they have the same strategy going out in their door-to-door -door witnessing campaign. They have the same lines, the same strategy, the same, uh, the same teaching. They're all on the same page in 148 different languages, 8 million people across the world. But they'll look at us and say, there's hundreds of Christian denominations, and you guys disagree on everything. It's like, that, look how unorganized that is. That's, that's unorganized. There's, you know, God is the author of confusion. You got Calvinism and Arminianism and... And, and all these different isms. And, and like, no, we're, we're, we got 8 million strong all on the same page. In their mind, that's a very big uh, compliment to the Watchtower and their ability to be, uh, call themselves the, uh, God's, God's sole prophet or line of communication. All right? They, they believe that you and I don't really read our Bibles. Most of the Christians that they'll experience, they don't find people who know their Bible. So when they find one, it's... it's it's shocking to them, all right? So they think most of the people that go to church, they just listen to what the pastor says. We read a couple of verses. We tell a few funny stories. And, and then the Bible sits there and collects dust the rest, of the rest of the week, okay? That's what they're thinking when they're talking to you and me. They believe that we're blinded by the devil. So that, that any influence, any uh, type of argumentation that we would bring forth is literally demonic in influence, okay? They believe that that we think that Jesus is God, so we're worshiping a false god, or we're, we're worshiping a non-god, as we'll, we won't call him a false god, as we're going <laughs> to, we're going to talk about John 1, 1 in a little bit, but we're worshiping a non-god, or a lesser god, but we're not worshiping Jehovah God, which the Bible says is the sole god, or the only true god that is deserving of worship, okay? They think that, uh, I can't believe that you guys think that Jehovah God would send people to hell for all eternity. 
Can't believe that. That's, that's, that's horrible, right? And all those verses on hell, we're not going to get too much into that because there's, there's, some, there's some better ways to uh, do this. But they, they think that we worship the cross. Another, you know, another because of the obviously the Roman Catholic influence, the idolatrous nature of how they view uh, idols and symbols and saints and all these different things. But the cross in particular, they believe is a pagan symbol that was was brought in hundreds of years after Jesus died and introduced as a pagan symbol as as Satan kind of took the whole took hold of the church on earth. Okay, and so now we're all wearing a pagan symbol and we're praying to our cross and kissing our crosses and we're doing this and all that stuff. So they, they think that we're in, idol, in a form of idolatry with the cross thing, okay? So that we're hypocrites. Now, now here, check this out. I'll agree with them on this. <laughs> they witness a lot of hypocritical behavior. So the, the hypocrisy there, is, when they look at us for, for putting up with the drunkenness and putting up with people who are sinners, there's, they're looking at us as though, you guys are hypocrites, man. All right, so uh, you don't preach the word specifically, uh, i.e., going door to door. So like you're not you're not doing God's work. You're supposed to be going out and knocking on doors and 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 witnessing in this way. Okay, Jehovah's Witness, <laughs> come on in. But but because we're involved in politics and voting and military and all that and the, and the whole thing with Christians. You know, the Christian right wing and how they're involved in going, making wars and all this stuff over in the Middle East. That, like, all that stuff, just, that's just distasteful because the, the, the government is literally the tool that the enemy is going to use to try to overthrow uh, God's kingdom, right? So we're, if we're part, taking part in that government, they believe that we're part of the evil system. So um, th that's how they think of us when we're talking like that. And then the amount of persecution they get it's tremendous, and I got, I'm going to tell you a little bit on, on that now, but they, they don't believe that we're persecuted. Because we're such hypocrites, because we look so much like the world looks, that we're not getting persecuted because the, the world is okay with us, because the Christians are drinking with them at the bar and hanging out with them at strip clubs, you know? And, um, and, it's, and so they'll go to the, go to the bar on uh, Saturday night and show up at church at late for the 1 p.m. service on Sunday. <laughs> 